You must also remember that this book is intended to distinguish, to, to differentiate true Christians from false Christians. And there are four things that John wants us to be certain of. The first two we will discuss this morning, and then the last two we'll discuss it next Sunday. But before we continue, let's pray to God. Our Lord, our God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And if your truth is that which sets us free, then we need, we need, Lord, to know your truth. And so we study this, we study your truth, we study your word, set our hearts free, free from the bondage of sin, free from misunderstanding, free from false teaching, free us, O oh God, to believe your truth. Would you please help us to be both hearers and believers of this truth? Enable me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we discussed the first two. The first one is in verse 13, the certainty of salvation. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. As I said last Sunday, these things refer, the phrase these things refer to the entire letter. John is telling us the purpose of his writing of the book that is to promote assurance of salvation. That we will be assured that we really know God. And if we believe in the name of the Son of God, if we believe in the work and the person of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ, then we will know that we have eternal life. John doesn't want us to hope so. John wants us to know so. And we will know, brothers and sisters in Christ, because God's testimony about His Son is trustworthy. And this knowledge is revealed to us in the Scripture, in the Bible. Now, to believe in the name of any God, to believe in the name of any God, however you understand Him to be, you will not be saved. A sincere Muslim may believe in the name of Allah. He may believe in the name of Allah, but he won't be saved. Because he's not calling on the name of the Son of God. He's not calling on the name of Jesus Christ. A Hindu may believe in the name of many deities. But he won't be saved because he's calling out on demons and not the Lord Jesus Christ. A, a, a Buddhist may call upon the name of Buddha, but he won't be saved because Buddha is not the Lord Jesus Christ. A sincere, faithful Roman Catholic may call upon the name of the Pope. He may call upon the name of disciples of Mary, but he won't be saved because he's not calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To call upon the name of the Lord implies faith in Him, that Jesus has the ability to save you, that Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the promise. He is, the, he is prophesied in the Old Testament. He is the Savior of the world. No mere man, not even an angel, can save you, can save me from the wrath of God. Only God can do that. Now, if the sovereign God tells us that this is the testimony about his son. Remember our study last week? And his death and his baptism testify that this Jesus is really the son of God. And we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit testifying that Jesus is the son of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Is it? No, is it worthy that we take his word, we take him at his word? Is it reasonable to take him at his word? If we do not do that, then we would call him a liar. Not to do so. Not accepting the testimony of the Father about the Son. You call him a liar. No matter what you are. No matter what you have done. No matter how far from God you may be. If you call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ then you will be saved from this judgment. You call upon the name of the Lord in faith. 
Okay? And I, I have discussed that last Sunday. Now, the Bible is very clear that if salvation depends on anything in us, no one will be saved. Because no one seeks for God in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Since faith and repentance are pleasing to God, the natural man cannot believe in Christ or repent of his sins unless it is granted to him. So the principle here, salvation does not depend on the merits or good points of man's nature, but rather on God's free grace. God did not choose you or me because he saw something worthy in our nature. No. We have not done anything to make us worthy of God's grace. Remember what I said last Sunday? But we can only see or we can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ if God has moved and opened the eyes of our hearts, if He has uh, regenerated us. Before we are dead to sin, we were dead to sin but now alive to Christ. Before we were blinded to the truth of His word but now we can see. It is only because God has regenerated. God has given us that life that we are now a new creation in Him. You see, God didn't look down through time. And then He says, Oh, someday I see Carlo and Joey that they will choose me by their free will. And then they will be good, make, they will make good leaders of GCF in me. And so I will elect them. No? That would make God's election dependent on something that is good in man, mainly his wise choice or his faith or his potential. Now, if God grants salvation on anything good in us, then that is not God's free grace. That is human merit. If God grants salvation because of anything in man, that is not God's free grace. It is human marriage. But again, we have to be reminded, it is easy to say, oh, Pastor, I really believe in the name of the Son of God. I believe that He's the one who has been prophesied, He's the one promised in the Old Testament. He's the Savior of the world. But there will be marks of true conversion. There will be signs of regeneration. There will be signs of new life. When God converts a sinner, there are inevitable marks of conversion. Remember, in our study of this book, there are three tests to test our faith. The doctrinal test, believing in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. The moral test, loving His Word, loving the Word of God. Again, doing, reading the Bible, obeying His commands, growing in holiness, sinning less and less, and then the relation of this that we are to love one another as the Lord has loved us. You know, one important mark of conversion is there is conviction of sin. There is conviction of sin. Because before a man becomes a saint, he must first see himself as a sinner. When some may be deeply convicted of their sins before their conversion, to show their great need of salvation, of a Savior, others may experience it more in depth in the years that may follow. And that is my experience, my personal experience, and I'm sure as it is with many who have been raised in Christian homes. But there is no such thing as a truly born-again Christian who loves the growing sins of his own sinfulness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the closer we walk in the light, the more the light will reveal the dirtiness, the filthiness of our own sinful hearts. In lamenting the shallow and spurious conversion of his day, Charles Spurgeon said, Today we have so many built up who were never put down. So many filled who were never emptied. So many exalted who were never humbled. 
that I the more earnestly remind you that the Holy Ghost must convict you of sin, must convince you of sin, or we cannot be saved. How do you regard sin? And how is the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin? Are you the same, Panel, last week or last month? Or you have grown in holiness that your say, let's say your favorite sin, you have been sinning less and less and less. Now, verse 13 says again, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So it was written that so it was written not that you may believe. It means that you have already believed in Him. Okay, that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. I, I do not know how many Christians have I talked to in my 15 years of pastoral ministry who have struggled in some measure with the assurance of salvation. But to me, this is one of the great testimonies that the scripture is the very word of God. So much so that scripture is taken up with assuring Christians of their salvation. How could it be? How could it be that uninspired men who have written 1,000 or 2,000, 3,500 years ago would know that until now there are still people who would struggle in the assurance of salvation? Pastor John told me, that more than 40% still struggle among the youth, among the young people, they struggle about the assurance of their salvation. How would that mean, those men know about this? They wouldn't know, but in God's infinite wisdom, because He's the ultimate author of His Word, He has written these things for them, meant for these people, for us, from before the foundation of the world. Because He knows that his dear children would struggle in some measure with assurance of salvation. And that for me is one of the great testimonies of the truth of the scripture. And John wants us to see that assurance, now listen, John wants us to see that assurance is vital to the stability and the energy of Christian life and service. And so he wants to do what he can to encourage us in growing into a robust assurance of salvation. So that's the first thing. He wants to promote this, that we are assured of our salvation. Perhaps as we have studied First John in the first six months of this year, maybe you like me uh, have, have known that this is a very tough book. It really forces some soul searching self-evaluation, self-examination. But John is saying, though we have to do the work of self-examination, I am writing these things to you to encourage you, not to discourage you. And my purpose, he says, my purpose is not to raise doubts in your faith. My purpose is to confirm faith in you. The assurance in Christian life he wants us to give assurance in the Christian life. And therefore, let us pray for one another to grow in our assurance of salvation. Because an assured Christian is a bold Christian. An assured Christian is an energetic Christian. A Christian who is in active service to the Lord. You know, we are bold you, could, you would be bold if you're assured because you're not just looking out at the material blessings here. Your eyes are fixed on the things that are above and that you would be with Him. That's why you can obey even the difficult commands of the Bible because you're looking forward to having that, that, that fellowship with God. Not just only here. Remember that the martyrs, the, the martyrs of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 at the second half? We don't know their names. But why? Were they so bold? Because they know, they knew that they would be with God after that. And that's John's desire that we grow in the assurance of our salvation. And secondly, 
that we may have the confidence of answered prayer. In verses 14 to 17, Christian's assurance of answered prayer is the topic of verses 14 to 17. And as we pray with the assurance of salvation, and as we pray of knowing, of, the, of, the sure, of being assured that we really know God and we are His children, it will change our practice of prayer. Now, someone approached me and said, Pastor, you said last Sunday, our passage was the most difficult in the entire Bible. But for me, this seems to be more difficult than last Sunday. I don't know if you have struggled with this. How will you apply the sin unto death in your prayer life? Or, he says, if you pray according to his will, he will hear your prayer. So no is not an answer there. It must be yes all the time. If you pray according to his will. Haven't you struggled with this? Haven't you prayed for someone for his salvation and then he died? He did not become a Christian. Isn't that the will of God for someone to be saved? We will answer that later, okay? Have you prayed for a couple? They are not in good relationship and then they separate the grace. Aren't you struggling? Did you have any struggle with this text? If you pray according to his will, he will hear your prayers. He will grant. That's positive healing, mind you. Or how are you going to use sin unto death in your prayer life? So today, I believe it's also a difficult task, but I just want you to know that John wrote these verses to encourage us in prayer. So I want to encourage you to, uh, to pray more faithfully. God is a prayer hearing God. Now, you see, let's, let's go to our discussion of verses 14 to 17. John is echoing the promises made, the repeated promises made by the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 11, 22 to 24, and John chapters 14, 15, and 16. It says, if we ask anything, According to God's will, He will answer favorably. Again, no is not an answer then. No is not an acceptable answer. It must be yes every time. Now, verse 14 is closely connected to verse 13. In the Greek text, it starts with the word in. So confidence, now listen. Confidence in prayer is founded in the assurance that you have eternal life. Are you with me? Confidence in answered prayer is founded if you are assured that you have eternal life. There is certainty. This is the confidence that I have. That we have. John says. So our confidence there is founded in the assurance that we have eternal life. If you do not have eternal life, if you are not a truly born again Christian, there is no way that you can pray according to the will of God except to pray that God would save you from your sins. Let me ask you, does God ever answer the prayers of unregenerate people? Does God ever answer the prayers of unregenerated people? He will answer the prayers of confession and faith in Christ. He will answer the prayers for salvation, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But the question is, can or uh, will God answer the general prayers of unbelieving people? The answer to that question is, He may choose to but he is not obligated to. He may choose to. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants to do it. it and it may suit his purpose to hear some of the petitions of the unbelievers, but he is no obligation. He is not obligated to do it, to answer the prayer. Therefore, there is no certainty that can be given to an unbeliever, to a non-believer, to a non-Christian, that God will hear anything that he prays. But for Christians 
we are certain that He will answer our prayers. Again, it is founded in the assurance that you have eternal life. So therefore, it is very important that we grow in the assurance of salvation. So what is the premise of verses 14 and 15? When we pray, God will hear us. John has already brought up this idea. We can have confidence that we will receive what we ask if we are obedient to Him. Listen, we are confident that we will receive what we have asked if we are obedient to God. He mentioned that in our study in 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. Now, if you want your prayers to be answered, then you are to be obedient. Now, how can you be obedient to the commands of God if you don't know what is written in the scriptures? If you are not reading your word or the word of God. So you have to read the word of God so you will know his commands. And when you obey those commands, he says in 1 John chapter 3, I will answer your prayers. Now he has repeated the same emphasis here in our text. Brothers and sisters in Christ, prayer is not an optional, it's not optional for God's children. It is absolutely essential because if you do not pray, you are not living by faith in God. I really believe that prayer is one of the marks of true conversion. Not just praying ritualistic prayers. Prayer that comes from within. Prayer that comes sincerely from the heart. You know, sometimes I would just laugh at my children. I would say, I'm not telling you you pray. We're going to trouble. Instantly, automatically, Lord, thank you for the food. <laughs> automatically. If you do not pray, you are trusting yourself. Which is exactly how the world lives. This is the confidence that we have before Him. The term confidence literally means freedom of speech. We feel a freedom to go before the Lord on any issue, on any issue. And we can freely and boldly ask. We're even instructed in Hebrews, remember, that we can come to the throne of grace boldly, confidently, and seek what we need. And we can find the grace, we can find the mercy. Remember, brothers and sisters in Christ, our confidence then is not only in the life to come, but that here and now that we have access to God. We're not yet in His eternal presence. We're not yet in the heaven of heavens. We have not entered into the eternal inheritance that has been laid up for us. But you know what? Our confidence, brothers and sisters in Christ, we now have access to all the resources of God through the means of prayer. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that amen? I don't know. We now have access to all the resources of God through the means of prayer. Amen? Amen. So, but we have to be assured of our salvation prayers. That's why John says, this is the confidence that we have before Him. We are confident enough to go right before, right directly to the eternal presence of God and ask boldly and, and, and freely of what we need. Now, if we pray according to His will, He hears us. Now, hearing here means more than listening and knowing the request. It's positive hearing. It's a hearing that's going to dispatch the right answer. Since God hears everything, and he knows the unspoken secrets of our hearts. John is saying here, and he means that God will hear us favorably coming to our aid. That's what he means, that God hears us. 
If we ask according to His will, listen, if we ask according to His will, it is a blank check, literally. It's a blank check. And the blank check is the will of God. Anything on the bank of His will, we can request. Just, just imagine if, if Deacon Shani will give me a blank check. Diba? Aren't you excited? Blank check, wala lang pangalan yung bank. <laughs> but, but here God is saying, blank check. The will. The bank of His will. Look at us. We can request anything. So whatever you're going through, you know, we can request. And there is that certainty that He will answer that prayer. Now verse 15. And if you know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from Him. The idea of verse 15 is that we know that we presently have Okay, that we presently have whatever we have asked in accord to His will. We may not, now listen, this will explain, sometimes you've heard name it, claim it, okay? Now this is not what it's saying, we may not actually see it for many years, but it is as good as done. Did you get that? Abraham prayed for a son and the Lord said, okay, I'll give it to you. But it was 25 years before he held Isaac in his arms. There is much in scripture that tells us about waiting on God. So it would be a great mistake. It would be a great mistake if we think that God is promising that if we pull the prayer level immediately, all the goodies will come out from the shoot. No. No. Sometimes, in his purpose, in his wisdom, he delays answers to our prayers for years. For years. You know, I was so excited when the time came that I would be restored and I would go back in the ministry. I'd been away for a year and I said, Lord, thank you. But it was too late. It was delayed for two years. But as I told Attorney Joey and Elder Carlo, you know those two years, those two waiting years, was the best time for me. Because it really humbled me before him. It's not that, Lord, I need this, you claim it by pay, and then you have it. No. No. We should, but we should continually pray until the request until the request is granted. Now, we should stop praying if it is not in accordance to His will. Example, Lord, please, sana mapansin ako ng cross ko na hindi Christian. <gasps> stop praying. Lord, itong alaga akong number for one year. Tomorrow, tatama na sana sa loto. Please, I'll give 90% to the lot acquisition project of GCF Northeast. No! Stop it! That is not in accordance with this one. Again, hearing is answering for God. Hearing is answering for God. No limits. Only blank check with only one qualifier. What's the qualifier? If it is done in according to His will. Imagine what an outstanding confidence that is. That even we wait for the full redemption of our bodies. That we wait for the next life. That while we wait, brothers and sisters in Christ, to receive all that God has prepared for us, we have the confidence that for the meantime, our prayers will be answered. Beautiful? What a beautiful promise. But what is again the premise of that promise? Pray according to God's will. You see, many people who do not know God pray, but they are not seeking God's will in their prayers. Rather, they are trying to use God, whoever they conceive Him to be, to grant their request, to grant what they want 
But biblical prayer is not trying to talk God into giving us what we want. Rather, it is submitting our will to His will. It is praying, Lord, it's just like uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ has instructed to us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, it would be at the height of stupidity that when you pray that my will be done, not God's will. See that? For one thing, it would mean that you are better than God when it comes to what is best for your life. He knows everything. He knows everything and He has even assured us that His love is far greater than the best that the Father loves His children. So it only makes sense to submit to and pray for His will for our lives. And also to pray for your will against God's will would be asking God to abdicate His sovereignty over the universe and submit to you as the sovereign. Again, that would be an epitome of stupidity. Now here's the difficulty. When I presented this to the elders yesterday, I told them this is the difficulty of the text. How do we determine what God's will is so we can pray in line with it? Well, we know, as Attorney Joey said, if you know God, therefore you will know his will. No, when you know it's not just again not knowing him. But when you grow deep in your relationship, as you delight in him, he will what? Grant you the desires of your heart. He puts the desire in your heart. And what you what you're praying for is what he has placed in your heart, and therefore he will answer it. But here's the question now. Are we talking about the will, God's will of desire? Or God's will of decree. God's will of decree is what He has determined to do. In this sense, God works all things after the counsel of His will. Ephesians 1 11. Everything that happens takes place because God ordained it. God decreed it. If this is the universe here, before the foundation of the world, He has already decreed. The purpose, the counsel, the will of God, that's the decree. Everything that happens here, it is because he has decreed it. And that's why he is omniscient, because he has already decreed it. He knows. He knows all things. Now, if anything could happen outside his will, then he is not in control of the universe. Then he is not the sovereign who plans and does it. But God's will of desire is very much different with God's will of decree. You see, God does not in any sense desire man to sin. Okay? He doesn't desire man to sin. But He permitted or He allowed the fall of man. And then He ordained the cross as a means of rescuing us from sin. Although He ordained those events, God did not cause Adam and Eve to sin. And he was not responsible for the evil deeds of the men who crucified Jesus on the cross. He was not responsible. They sinned because of their own evil desires. God took no delight in their sin. He takes no pleasure in sin. And yet, he ordained Jesus to die in the hands of sinners. So here's the difficulty when it comes to praying for God's will. It is God's will of desire that all men will be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4 Yet we know that in His decree, God has will to save only His elect. Listen. It's His desire that all men will be saved. But His decree, only those who have been elected will be saved. So it would be going against God's will to pray, Lord, would you please save everyone in this world? Right? It will be going against God's will to pray, Lord, please save everyone in this world. Now, if I can explain it further, He wants all men to be saved. Is He referring to His elect? 
So that will be the discussion by Attorney Joey, okay, in our discipleship track. Now, again, it would be going against his will to pray that all men, Lord, would you save all men in this world? In fact, you know, Jesus excluded the world in his priestly prayer in John 17, verse 9. He excluded the world. But we should pray, God, please save my loved one, save my neighbor. The problem is I cannot know in advance whether or not he's going to do it because I don't know his decree. And therefore, I ask and I pray, not my will, but yours be done. And that's the approach. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Another difficulty to pray according to God's will, it is because his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Remember John the Baptist, he was in prison. If you were a disciple of John the Baptist, I'm sure you would pray, Lord, would you please release him in prison so that he'll have more years of effective ministry, right? But what was God's way? A lustful, drunken king who made a stupid promise that resulted in John's head to be served in a platter to Solomon. You get that? If you were the brother of James, you were the apostle John, I'm sure you would have prayed, Lord, would you please release my brother in prison? In fact, he's one of the inner uh, circles of disciples that are very close to you. Right? And his gifts to be needed in the early church. But what God did, he allowed Hero to put James to death through the sword. But he sent an angel to save Peter from the same fate. How would you explain that? His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Well, it was not mentioned in the scriptures that John prayed for James, but I couldn't imagine anything else. He was a very prayerful person. You know. But why was his request not granted? Because it is not the will. It was not the will. And when Satan, remember Satan, he asked permission from Jesus, I would like to save Peter like a weed. If you were one of the disciples of Jesus, or if you were one there who heard what Satan said, I'm sure you would pray, Lord, please, please, I hope that Peter would be able to resist that attack of the enemy. But what was the prayer of Jesus? That he would not ultimately fail. So he would allow him to fail. And then when he is restored, he will strengthen the brothers and the ministry. You see, I hope that I'm not discouraging you from praying. But I want you to understand that while God promises to hear our prayers, He will grant our request if we pray according to His will. It is not a simple name it and claim it process. It's not. You see, God's will is that His kingdom will come. And yet the outworking of His will involves thousands of years and many setbacks. Until now, we're still waiting for the kingdom to come. We must persevere, brothers and sisters in Christ, in prayer, even when we do not understand His will or His ways. That's the general principle. That when we pray, God will grant it if it is prayed according to His will. Now we see the example, the last one in verses 16, 17. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Isn't this what the law? But don't get confused by what this is. Now, John is saying that he is just giving us an example of how to pray in accordance to his, to his will in a very specific situation of intercession. A specific example, he gives this, okay? This is what you're going to pray in accordance to his will. I'll give you an example. He did this, okay? You are praying for someone who has fallen to sin, 
Okay? You are praying for someone who has fallen to say, Lord, please turn him back from that sin. And John says in verses 16, 17, that if we pray in accordance to his will, that that brother will turn from his sin, then he will hear the prayer. If it is in accordance to his will. Then he has a statement that makes it magulo. I do not say that we are to pray for the one who has sinned and to sin the sin unto death. Commentators, good commentators, hundreds of years have struggled with the definition of this. What is John talking about that sin that leads to death? Is he talking about the difference between the distinction between venial and mortal sin? Is he talking about the sin that is beyond forgiveness? Is he talking about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Or is he just talking about apostasy? You see, remember 1 John? They were Gnostic teachers. They have that secret knowledge. They have that special knowledge. That when you have this knowledge, by the way, sa kanila lang yun, it's unique to them, the Gnostic teachers. And if you possess this special knowledge, it will give you a higher level of spirituality. And therefore, they have turned their backs, these people who believe in these Gnostic teachers, they have turned their backs on the Jesus of the apostle of the apostles' teaching. They have turned back of the, uh, on the Jesus of the Bible and they have left the church. Now, John is saying, when you pray for those people who have renounced their faith, Lord save them even though they have renounced their faith. That is not right. John is writing in a context where people have renounced their faith. Okay? Again, Okay? If you see a brother falling into sin, you pray for that person. Now, God in His mercy, if it is according to His will, God in His mercy will restore that person. Okay? But don't pray. He's saying, John is saying, Lord, even though that person renounces Jesus, would you still save him anyway? That is what he's saying. It is not in accordance to His will. God doesn't save people who have renounced Jesus who have rejected. When I say rejected, they have renounced Jesus like the, the, those people who have renounced their faith. Okay? It's not that we reject. No, I have to make this clear. There are times, how many of you have been shared of the gospel and you rejected Christ about so many times? Oh, di ba? So, andirito kayo ngayon. No? Baka sabihin, I don't pray for them. No. But he's saying here, these people, they have renounced. Lord, would you please save them apart from Christ? That is what John is saying. Would you please save them apart from Christ? He won't save them. Because that is not what he said in his word. He will draw them to faith in Christ. If God will save them, he will draw them to faith in Christ. He will open their eyes and that he will see who is Christ. They will understand the person and work of Christ. Okay? But if God did not open their eyes and then, Lord, kahit hindi na elect, save them. It's wrong to pray, Lord, save everyone in this world. It's wrong. It's wrong. Brothers, we would say, Pastor, hindi naman talaga kami ganun mag-pray eh. The Lord, save mo. Pero if... If that is not what you've said in the Bible, okay. But you know, we do this every day. You know, there are times, as I was, I attended the wake of my uncle in Pangasinan. You see, my uncles in, in Pangasinan, they were past, they are pastors. They are pastors, but they belong to, they are masons. They have bisho, they, they smoke. And then my cousin told me, Kuya Boyet, is the church that you are pastoring, would they agree that our uncles are safe? I said no. How can we tell now to the folks that even though they have received Christ when they were small, but they are not reading the word of God, they are not walking their talk, they are not praying, Oh, pastor sila, pastor. But have you heard the message? My cousin said, have you heard the message of Uncle Luke? 
Kulto the team. Now, you tell that to our folks, I'm sure they will get angry at you. Because they believe that they are saved because once in their lifetime they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In spite or despite of the fact that they haven't read the Bible. I told her, you have the resources. Gather the clan and we will preach the gospel. But that's what we do. And sometimes it's so painful, di ba? Losing someone you've been with and you know he's going to church. But he doesn't read the Bible. He doesn't pray. So it's easy. It's so easy to be tempted. Lord, would you save him apart from Christ? Would you please uh, save him in spite of ito siya? But God will only save his people according to what he said in his word. And he will draw people to faith in Christ. That's how he's going to save and that's what the example is telling us. That is what the example is telling us. Brothers, if God is going to save people, He's going to save them the way that He says He will in His Word. Whatever else you ask, according to His will, He hears. And if He hears, He answers. And if he answers, you have us. You have what you ask. Apart from those extreme examples that we've given, brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that it is clear that you have the certainty of the assurance of salvation because that is where founded your answers to prayers. And if you don't pray, if you don't use that opportunity to call upon the Lord, Brothers and sisters in Christ, therefore, you take him very lightly. You don't take him seriously. Imagine you have all the resources that you have, that, 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 heavens, that heaven has. You have all those resources and then you don't still pray. Come on. And we should start a movement here that we keep on praying. Our midweek, we are only five, we are only seven. But we should be excited to go there because we want to avail of the resources of heaven and it's so saddening the GCF Northeast we want to be known as a church that prays but nobody comes on midweek service nobody prays is the prayer only for the leaders of the church no it's for us all of us we should pray and what is corporate prayer? And that is very really important. Oh, how I wish I would see our prayer room filled with people praying to God. We have only two certainties that we have discussed the certainty of salvation and the confidence in prayer. Lord, thank you for your work. May this sermon move us from you to be people who wants to pray, who wants to intercede for everyone. And I pray, Lord, that you move us, oh God. Help us as we evaluate ourselves. Are we really born again Christians? Lord, would you search our hearts? Move us, Lord. Make us, Lord, realize the importance of reading your word. Loving your word, obeying your word, because that is your promise. That we can have confidence that we will receive our prayer items, our prayer requests, our petitions, if we are obedient to you. And we can only know your will as we delight in you, because you will grant the desires of our Lord. Thank you so much, so God, for your word. Thank you so much, Lord, for loving your people, loving Jesus of your grace. Bless us, Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.